Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Mellon Foundation. I'd like to begin by inviting all of you to continue saying hello in the chat. The chat is poppin' on this first day of spring. Some of you tell us you are seeing snow and some of you are seeing azaleas. You are writing in from Jersey City, Oaktown, Stockton, Kalamazoo, Abenaki Land, Decatur, Pittsburgh, Fargo, Fairbanks, Flint, Albuquerque, Fort Worth, and so many other places. So keep on telling us, it's wonderful. Ooh, and I see Harlem, USA. We hope to know who you are, where you're watching from, and if you have any questions for our wonderful speaker this afternoon. We would like to see lots of comments and exchanges in the chat to continue throughout the program. And today, I am delighted, I am thrilled, I am heartful to be joining Michelle Norris for a discussion of her extraordinary new book, Our Hidden Conversations, What Americans Really Think About Race and Identity. This book is a collection of writings and photographs from the Race Card Project, which Michelle Norris created in 2010. The Race Card Project is a global storytelling campaign that invites people to share their personal experiences of race in just six words. It has generated more than a half million responses from all 50 states and nearly 100 countries. Our Hidden Conversations is the realization of Michelle's many years of work on the Race Card Project. It is an illuminating book, a beautiful book, a mournful book, at times a shocking book, and a powerful demonstration of our complex and multivocal United States and the infinitely fascinating conundrum of race. Our Hidden Conversations is also a reflection of her expertise and enduring achievements as an internationally celebrated journalist, memoirist, and storyteller. Michelle has devoted her entire career to exploring the human stories behind our country's news and most complex issues. She is the author of a family memoir entitled The Grace of Silence, has written and corresponded for ABC News, the LA Times, and the Washington Post, has served as co-host of NPR's All Things Considered, so you all will have the pleasure and the comfort and the delight of hearing her voice again, and currently works as the producer and host of the podcast, Your Mama's Kitchen, where noteworthy people talk about the food they grew up with and the lessons learned around the kitchen table. In the course of her extraordinary career, she has earned an Emmy Award, two Peabody Awards, and four nominations for the Pulitzer Prize. I am honored to have known Michelle personally for many years and to count her as a wise, rich-souled, beloved friend. Michelle, we welcome you and we thank you so much for joining us. It's so good to be with you. I always love spending time with you and I look forward to our conversation. And we have so much to talk about today. <laughs> So much to talk about today. Um, let's start right in because I have lots of questions for you. And uh, as you can see, the audience is 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 at the ready. So we'll get going. Um, you've characterized your work, uh, which I think powerfully, this is obviously not your last project, but I feel like it is quite a culminating project. So much of what you've been doing and thinking and kind of the grand project of the American story that is your whole career comes to a very, very remarkable uh, embodiment with our hidden conversations. And you've described it as a conversation starter about race. So I wanted to ask you about starter. How did you pick that characterization and how are you seeing it play out? Well, may I begin in gratitude because I'm so grateful to be with you today, Mellon. Thank you very much, the Mellon Foundation, for uh, permitting us to share time together um, through Zoom in a way that we usually do at a kitchen table. So um, yes. the people to us are, are getting sort of a glimpse of what we do um, through our friendship, which is talk and talk about big yes. issues. And, and thanks to everybody who's joining us this afternoon. I called it a, ca a conversation starter, Lizzie, because I want it to be catalytic. When mm. I'm collecting the, I don't just want it to be sort of a menagerie. 
collection that I wall off in some archive or some box that I hope in some way that people are able to see someone else's life and think about their own and then talk about it. That what they see and hear and experience will animate their thinking in such a way that they either want to share it with someone or they want to ask a question or that it stokes some kind of curiosity. And I think that that is particularly important right now for a couple of reasons. One, we we live in a moment where we all have these devices that allow us to communicate more freely and more often, but it doesn't mean that we are better informed. It means that mm-hmm. we're often we're often consuming a media diet or a communications diet through our devices of one kind or another, computers, handhelds, that affirms or confirms everything we already believe. And mm-hmm. I think that that kind of curiosity, stoking curiosity, stoking interest in someone else's story is also important because there are a lot of forces at work right now that are trying to dampen our curiosity, that are trying to dampen Mm -hmm. conversation, close the portholes to human experience. And so the book and the project in some ways is, is, is like peering inside someone else's home, peering inside someone else's life. At a time where it's a little bit harder to do that, because as a society, we are often so walled off or siloed or in our own sort of spaces that we can see things, you know, on the phone. But that is that's somewhat performative. Mm-hmm. Um, it is censored in some way. And what I realized very early on when I was collecting these stories is that people were revealing themselves in ways that I had not experienced as a journalist. And so the mm-hmm. other reason that I conversation starter is I want to let other people in on the action. You know, I'm mm. seeing things that I, I it was like a taproot, you know, into something that even after more than 30 years of covering, as you say, America's grand story, there were a lot of things that I just wasn't getting to. And when you let mm-hmm. people set the, their own agenda by just saying, tell me your stories about race, not tell me about your anger or anxiety, just tell me about whatever you want to talk about. What they serve up is something different than what I cover when I traditionally am covering stories about race, because I'm usually there because something has happened that merited my attention. And in this case, Mm -hmm. they're serving up so much more intimate. They're, they're taking us inside their lives with these stories. And I wanted other people to sort of look over my shoulder and see what I was seeing in the inbox. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, what I think is amazing. I mean, you're describing through your work, race is a topic that, you've been thinking about and exploring your whole life. I mean, in your work and outside of your work. And I would say the same thing about me, but everyone's a beginner when you come to this work, which I think is really, really extraordinary. And I I think that that's because you found a way for us to, in such small spaces, really, really listen to each other. And I think that that probably is an invitation to people who, for you know, it's it's a difficult topic, or maybe they haven't thought about race as such before, but have found that they actually do have something to say when asked that question. And, Which, by know, the way, about oh, go ahead, please. Sorry. Note there that that I think the six words was key, and the modeling through the website in a crazy way. Because when people saw it, other people sharing their stories, I think, oh, oh, these are this is the rules of engagement. I can share my story t- too. And mm-hmm. it's crazy that it's just six words. But if you asked for something more, if I asked for a sentence, oh, that's too much. I can't do that. I don't have time for that. Mm-hmm. If I asked for get it, that feels like a mandate. But six words, I think, you know, someone told me that when they filled it out this weekend, I, I was at the New Orleans Film Fest, uh, New Orleans Book Festival, and someone said mm-hmm. when they were trying to, it felt almost like a wordle-like exercise, like it felt like it had a mm-hmm. little bit not a game, but a challenge, and I I think that was also part of the invitation. Well, and the question literally is: race your thoughts, give me six words. And just to read for everyone who's listening, a few of these, and boy, oh boy, can you go down the rabbit hole of the race card project and also down the rabbit hole of this book. I'm just reading a few. Uh, I mean, there are so many. With kids, I'm dad, 
a lone thug. I am not your model minority. Must we forget our Confederate ancestors? So where do you come from? Lady, I don't want your purse. So, I mean, we could do this for hours. And also, you know, that as a poet, I mean, you know, there is such a poetics to it. Um, but but take us through even how did you decide to do six words? How did you come to the genius of the format? I I did it out of a little bit of um, something just short of desperation and <laughs> concern because I had written that first book. The Grace of Silence, which was a family memoir. This was 2010, and America was in a different space. You have to let your mind go back to 2010. We were still talking about America being post-racial. Barack and Michelle Obama had just been through the White House. And and we were talking about, you know, our problems with race, if not being over, moving to a better, better, brighter space. And my Mm -hmm. experience is that was that most people didn't really want to talk about race. And I was going out on a 35 city book tour to promote the grace of silence. And I was going to be talking about race. And I thought no one's going to want to participate in this conversation. And as a journalist, I was actually eager not just to talk to people, but to have some sort of dialogue because I spent so much time cloistered in studio 2A or 4A. This was my chance to get out in the world. And so Mm -hmm. I wanted to use something that would, again, be catalytic, that would create a, an invitation for people to lean in a little bit. And six words, I thought, was well understood because there were lots of six-word exercises. There were six-word sports, six words Minneapolis, six-word memoirs. I mean, it was something that people, I think, understood. And it felt like it was not too big of an ask. And I actually, for the sake of our conversation, pulled out one of the original postcards. This is what they, oh, what they looked like. Oh, fantastic. This is one of the original ones. And I know it's one of the original ones because it's too small. Uh, My parents were postal workers. And when I created the invitation on postcards, that's where it began. I asked people to share their thoughts by sending it on a postcard. I went to Kinko's and and printed up 200 of these cards. And my mother and father are both postal workers. My father's gone to glory, but my mother is is still alive. Um, And she was thrilled that I was supporting the U.S. Postal Service. But Mm -hmm. she reminded me that cards were too small. They were not street legal. They were, they were not regulation <laughs> size. So I had to mm-hmm. print more. I know this is one of the original ones. Um, but I, I, I thought six words would be enough of an invitation. And then when the cards started coming in, you know, I printed 200 cards, about 30% of that original batch came back to us. And then I started printing cards like, a, you know, everywhere I went, I was leaving cards, printing cards. And I realized that, that, that six words that people could pack, you heard that in the the stories that you shared, people could pack so much into just six words that I knew that I was on to something interesting. I didn't know where it would go. I didn't know what it would lead to. I just knew that I had to keep going, that it was worth trying to continue to collect these stories um, because they were different than the kinds of things that, again, that I was hearing when I was behind the microphone, that I was hearing when I was going Mm out, you know, been covering the presidency of Barack Obama, which surfaced, you know, a different kind of conversation about race. When people talk to journalists, this was humbling to me, Lizzie, as a journalist, because people talk to us. I'm not saying they're not honest with us. I'm saying that they're a little bit guarded. Mm -hmm. And again, Mm -hmm. to answer a question, not with a journalist looking at them in the eye, not with a census taker asking them something, not with some sort of inquisitor but when they can take this card home and they can sit at their kitchen table with a writing instrument that they feel comfortable with. Um, and later we now collect most of the stories digitally because we created a website or they can sit in the glow of their computer screen or they can type out their truth with their thumbs sitting on the edge of their bed or in their most comfortable chair. The story that they choose to tell is just different. It's yes. informed that happened that day. It is more intimate. It is more personal the stories ricochet off the news when George Floyd was murdered. Inbox swells when there are a fracas at the border. The inbox swells when Barack Obama or Donald Trump does something. The inbox swells, but rarely do people mention those incidents or those names. When George Floyd is killed, when Ahmaud Aubrey is killed, what people talk about is their son. They talk about their commute. They talk about 
you know, the very thing that you talked about in your beautiful book, The Trayvon Diaries, they go mm-hmm. deep and they go inside, even though they're writing about something that ricochets off the news. They're giving us a different dimension. We understand how these events ripple and resonate in people's lives when they tell us their own stories, as opposed to getting sort of that man on the street interview with someone where you're asking, you know, how do you feel about something? Well, they're they're on their way to work. You know, what are they going to what are they going to tell you in just a few seconds? This is different. They've processed. They've had a meal at home. Maybe they've had a glass of wine. Maybe they're sitting in the car and they're just thinking about having just dropped their son or daughter off at the mall or something. And the story that you get is very different. And and I remember also you're telling me that some of them were written in in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, people up up thinking. And, you know, an extraordinary thing is happening in the chat. People are writing their six card, the six word stories. I've been trying to scribble these down by, uh, by making, uh, by, and keeping my eyes on you doesn't tell you all I am. I am only three generations removed. How do you pronounce your name? I thought black people had tails. Um, so yeah, it it's it's ha- it's happening right now. Um, so I think that that you know speaks to the generative power uh, of of this work. Uh, really, something. I also, you know, I, sometimes I don't know where my keys are because I have all these six word stories floating through my head, and how these yes. stories are are conversations. So whoever sent in about you know something about not being able to pronounce their name, I think of the retort to that. You know, someone else who wrote in can't pronounce my name, try harder. Um, mm, when you yes, mention, yes. Uh, lady, I don't want your purse. I was uh, in New York City at an event the day the book was released on January 16th. And someone sent in six words at that event that I always think as the retort to lady, I don't want your purse. And all the stories that speak to what happens when you step into an elevator or walk down the street and you encounter someone who just pulls their purse a little bit tighter, checks their wallet, hard or when they see you. And this person sent six words in that I think is in direct conversation with lady, I don't want your purse. Yes. I'm not intimidating. You are intimidated. Mm. Mm. I love that because it takes the handle on the cup and it just turns it in the other direction. This is not my issue. You know, I'm That's just going right. about my, right. I, you are intimidated by me. It's not because I am intimidated to you. I am just who I am. And you That's have right. to deal with whatever it is that stokes that fear inside your soul. Hmm. And there's been such an extraordinary journey to the, the, the object that is this book. I mean, we've talked about this for so long. It's, you've got this incredible archive. How are you going to um, both preserve this archive and animate this archive, put it to use? And so the book that you've made uh, uh, to sort of describe it for people who, I hope you're, you've already ordered your copies, you're about to order your copies, but it's an extraordinary book object. It's a patchwork quilt. It's a collage. Uh, there are it, it, the elements of design of the book uh, are very, very important. It's not the exact shape of a coffee table book, but it's a tome. Uh, it's a book that if you wanted to, you could read it through from beginning to end. Or, and the way that I have most enjoyed using it is, is going through, leaping ahead, going back. Um, it's, it's, it's quite an invitation into a very visually compelling world of ideas and humanity. So tell us about um, moving from the project into this form. I, I thought very carefully about the design and thank you for noticing that. I wanted to write a book of unusual form and, and you know, we spent a lot of time together. So you know how much time I spent in the basement where I was working on this, mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to take this archive and make it come alive. And I wanted it to be a jewel box of a book. I felt because it's a difficult subject, I wanted it to be inviting. I um, mean, it begins with that beautiful cover by Kadir Nelson. Yes. You know, he painted a cover called Totem, which is so beautiful and has this, these, this diverse characters 
you know, standing in almost a pyramid like a totem. And even when you look at them, you can't, you know, what are they? What's their background? So, you know, it's the, it's the invitation right at the beginning. I wanted, um, I wanted to include photos. I wanted to include fonts of different sizes. I wanted to include ephemera and um, indices. And I drove my publisher crazy because oh, wait, you want how many photos and you, you want to do what? <laughs> and, uh, but I knew I wanted it to be inviting to the eye. And I actually spent a little bit of time, I'm going to be careful and not say I studied composition, but I looked at how musicians compose both jazz and classical music, because I wanted to look at musical forms that have movements. And I wanted to include that in the composition of the book so that it would feel like the book moved at a different tempo at different times. So you would have periods of respite, and then you'd have periods where it felt like the whole world was coming at you. And you would have a moment of Trieste of, you know, where you could just kind of live in something and, and kind of marinate in it. And then you'd come out of that and you would feel the, you know, the equivalent of the um, the wind section, you know, kind of taking you faster. And and the book was designed in that way. And so what also there are preludes and echoes. So there are things that there are little Easter eggs throughout the book. And I'll give you an example. There's a story. Um, last night they burned they last night they burned Roscoe's house down a story um from someone who remembers his father coming home uh one night and and being very you know emotional and starting to cry because his friend Roscoe who was a man of color um had built a home that he was so proud of in a neighborhood that was newly integrated and um Roscoe was a World War II veteran and they burned Roscoe's house down and his dad was so upset about it. And the person who wrote this was an adult who was remembering in childhood that that was a baptism by fire, as it were, of understanding race and racial hatred. And that's at the beginning of the book, or first third of the book. And you might think, oh, that 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 doesn't, you know, that's that must be a one-off. That's an unusual case. But then later in the book, there is another example where a police officer tells a group of kids that if they um, if they play with each other. Um, the new family moves in, and if, if they actually wind up accepting this new black child into their friend, their circle of friends, um, that someone's going to burn the house down. And it's it's put there for a reason to remind you that America, that history kind of it happened decades apart. But it's an example of the preludes and the echoes that I also used in the book to understand how history, unfortunately, can keep repeating itself and sort of moves in an undulating fashion. So a lot of work went into actually designing the book, and it was designed exactly as you say, so you could read it start to finish, or you could pick it up on on really any page, and and get lost in inside of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, should, I, I interesting also because in the because I worked on audio for so long, I wanted the audio book to be a rich experience, and so I read the essays that I write. There are thirteen essays, but there are almost a thousand stories from individuals. And many of those individuals, in fact, most of them are reading their own stories. So when you listen to the audio book, it, it's this waterfall of uh, Americans, you know, speaking their own truths in their own voices. And it's amazing. I've heard, listened to some of those ex excerpts and they really, really are extraordinary. And just to also more things that are coming in the chat, uh, funny, honey, you don't look Jewish. Color blindness means you don't see me. Uh, you checked the wrong box. Erase. Uh, uh, my father left me escape money. Why do I feel so guilty? So again, we could we we could go on and 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 we'll um, uh, uh, hold on to the extraordinary things that are happening in in the chat. Um, I think father. also um, just another word on the form. Um, I think that it makes it a book that will stay in homes, stay in families, and that is meant to stay out. Uh, I, I hope that that is its its use because it just feels like you can't put it away in the shelf. It's bursting with 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 too much, and it's uh, what if we could put it in doctors and dentists' offices. I, I have thought about that. I have a dental appointment coming up and I was going to bring my book and just leave it there and, and say, 
great idea. And sometimes I will, I will leave like the way I used to leave postcards behind, I'll leave a book behind in a hotel lobby. Mm-hmm. Or if they're library at the hotel that I'm staying at, I'll just slot, you know, slot a book, a book in mm-hmm. there. So I love that. I love that. Um, you've said, and in talking, I'd like to to dig some more into this time of this book coming into the world. Um, you've talked about the race card project itself writ large as perhaps an archive of first the Obama years uh, and now an archive of Obama and Trump years as one way of thinking about you know, a period in our time where there are some very, very powerful racial climates and narratives. Um, but uh, so if you could say some more about that, actually, what 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 do the cards themselves tell us about as an archive of their times? And then also say some more about right now, this book's birth in the world. I liken the archive, the large archive, to social dendrochronology, dendrochronology being the study of tree rings. If you cut a tree down, the stump will tell you a story in the rings that you can see in that stump. And the tree ring will tell you a story and the tree ring never lies. It will tell you about the weather conditions. It will tell you if chemicals were introduced in the soil. It will tell you if development happened nearby that in some way impacted the root system. It will, it, it, it is a, a memoir of its own. And the archive, in some way, is like a social tree ring in that it captures, yes, the presidencies of Barack Obama and Donald Trump and now Joe Biden, punctuated by a global pandemic and the murder of George Floyd and Ahmed Aubrey and on and on, and economic tumult and a crisis at the border. Um, and, you know, so many other things are captured. But as I say, through personal experience, not necessarily mentioning all of those things. And there are a few things that are captured in the archive that don't make it into the news cycle. So we have seen in the 14 years that we've been doing this, a very large number, and in many years, the majority of the stories that we collected come from white Americans. And this was not something that I suggest, that I, excuse me, that I expected. It was a big surprise to me. And at first I thought, well, maybe it's because I was on National Public Radio and that reflects the audience, but I haven't been at National Public Radio since 2015. So that's not the case. Um, And so I think that that is a reflection of something that's happened in America where for many years, the question of race has been centered on people of color, on really black people in the main. And most times when we have a conversation or an examination of race, it's usually the case that black people are, it's, it's five, it's by, for, or about black people. And White Americans have somewhat of a bystander status or are considered sort of the cultural default in America. And at a moment when we're changing a page demographically, at a moment where our politics are much more openly about race, you know, it's not, it's not a a dog whistle, it's a bullhorn often, uh, that white Americans are thinking about their own racial identity and talking about their own racial identity in interesting ways. And not always through politics, also because there's much more intermarriage in America. There's much more um, fluid family systems for all kinds of reasons because of mixed marriages and, and children who claim more than one heritage because of adoption, because we live in more integrated spaces and people are thinking in different ways. And also because of our culture, our overall culture, the stories we read, the movies we watch. Um, We just see a a much more integrated America on our screens, in our books, in our advertisement. And and the archive reflects that in some way through the the stories that we collect. And also reflects more people who were left on the sidelines of a conversation that was primarily binary in terms of focused on black people or black and white people, um, coming into the frame and telling their stories in a much more fulsome way in the archive in the way that I think that that's happening in America, that we're seeing more stories that look at Asian life, that indigenous life, that that these are coming into sort of brighter relief. Um, We've been talking about race on the national scale, but I wanted to zoom into family um, and the ways in which 
so many of these stories talk about um, the pain and the revelation and the intimacy of race at a family level, um, and that family itself is still the locus of so much pain and misunderstanding. So there's so much to say there, but could you take us into some of your reflections on the family zone in the race stories? When we talk about race in America, unless we're talking about marriage or um, uh, uh, some other you know, adjudication of family policy, that part of the story we don't often get to, the behind closed doors story. And and this book is a little bit like walking through America's neighborhoods at a moment when everyone window everyone's window is open and you can just hear their business. And you're hearing what happens in the private spaces, in the in the kitchen, in the bedroom. And many of these stories help fill in sort of the holes around the bigger conversation around race. So when we think about blended marriage, for instance, and we think about that being a big whoosh forward in America, you know, if you look at the number of, we're we're enough to remember, you know, to have been alive when guess who's coming to dinner was released, you know, not long after. Right. Um, And now you can't turn on the television without seeing blended families and television advertisements. If you go to the movie or the mall or a sporting event this weekend, I guarantee you, you'll see people who are loving across some sort of line, religion, color, ethnicity. And that is a big step forward. But what this book shows is the complexities of what happens inside the house when that happens. The um, who's, whose holiday are we going to celebrate? You know, what will the food smell like and look like at the holiday table? What box will our children check when they go to school? Because in many cases, there's still just one box to check. And for children who are the progeny of biracial unions, um, it's not the end of a complicated chapter about race, but maybe the opening of a new and differently complicated chapter, because many of them feel like they have a foot in both worlds and don't belong fully in either. Um, They feel one way when they are at one stage in life, and then they feel a different way when they get older or move geographically. And it helps us understand that we don't live inside, you know, boxes of fixed certitude, you know, around Mm -hmm. our racial Mm -hmm. identity. And, And so this is, again, the word I keep coming back to again and again is intimacy and the intimacy within a family is often reflected. And the other place that we see that is intergenerationally. We were yeah. surprised at how often mm-hmm. the words grandma, grandpa, grandparents came up. And in retrospect, mm-hmm. I should not have been surprised. Mm-hmm. Because if you think of the life an 18-year-old lives and the life that a 98-year-old lived, or an 80-year-old, or even a 75-year-old, oh. there's a big gulf between oh. their experiences. And a lot of people are trying to understand their grandparents. A lot of people are making discoveries about their grandparents. Um, America is a place where a lot of people came here and beveled the edges of their identity. They decided to become something else on the way to becoming American. They decided not to talk about some aspect of their life. And later on, their kids are trying to figure that out and figure out who who are you, who were you, in some cases, What side were you on? Um, You know, tell us a story that you chose not to give us because you didn't want us to be weighed down by your disappointments or by a history that you chose to rewrite when you, you came here. And I am so honored that people are so candid in these stories because in many cases, they're gifting us with a story that they haven't shared in public. In some cases, they haven't shared with other people. There are two examples in the book where we received stories from the same household and the people within that household, in one case, a father and daughter, in another case, a husband and wife, they didn't know that they had each sent in stories to the race guard project. So they were talking to us, but not talking to each other. Mm, mm, mm. My goodness, my goodness. And to that word hidden, and there is a story, at least one story actually of a hidden birth certificate. Uh, you know, you're talking about, so if you could talk about things that are are literally hidden, deliberately hidden, but also more about what you want, because you used it carefully in the title, the word hidden to open up for us. 
um, you're, you're talking about a chapter called breadcrumbs. And again, that relates to grandparents, you know, or parents who left behind a trail. And in retrospect, people discover secrets. That chapter uh, was one of the hardest chapters to write because it's a candid chapter. And I wanted to write it in such a way that people didn't make judgments because those are three stories in that chapter about three women who all lied to their children. They all lied to their daughters, and it was because of the role race played in their life. Um, they had loved across a color line. They had decided to become something else. They had given up children because the children didn't look like them, and it was just too hard for them to live in a society where they were judged all the time. And that's an example of, of the hidden conversation, sometimes hidden in such a way that people lose a sense of themselves, lose a parent, lose their identity, lose their connection to the past, but also hidden in a way that doesn't allow us to wrestle with these really difficult things and figure them out and figure out how to move forward. And one of the things that we're trying to do now with this work is figure out how to take this amazing archive and the gift of this candor and use it in a way that is useful. You know, so for example, we are, um, we know that book clubs are starting to read the book, and that is a wonderful thing. And we're hoping that, um, again, comes back to this being catalytic, that this can maybe bring people together across difference. And so we are starting, um, and we're announcing it here, so you're all hearing it for you know the first time, uh, something called Dinner a Dozen, where once a month we're going to ask people it's almost like a contest. Tell us your story. Tell us why you want to bring people together. Tell us about the group you want to bring together and what do you hope will come out of that. And we will provide the books. I know I'm supposed to be in the business of selling books, but we want really to help stoke this conversation. And we will give you a dozen books and we will buy you dinner. And you decide who you want to bring together. And maybe it's a family that is adopting a child and they want to bring their community together to say, hey, we're about to bring someone who looks different. Let's all talk about this. Maybe it's a community where people just don't get along. Maybe it's a place where, you know, someone at the park is always presumed to be the nanny when she's just there mothering her children and she wants to bring the ladies at the park together for coffee to say, let's have a conversation about why you look at me and presume that I'm a caretaker rather than the mother of these children. And, um, and to, you know, bring small group discussions together because maybe that is a way that you can move these conversations forward. I, I now believe after doing this work that the most productive conversations about race in America are probably the ones you never hear because yes. they happen in yes. places. Well, and to that, and, and then we're going to go to questions. And thank you. Michelle is going to stay later, and I hope you all can stay until 510 to make up for a little bit of our lost time. Um, but you've been having a pretty extraordinary book tour. Um, you know, you've been in all kinds of different spaces, conversations with very, very different interlocutors. And I imagine also uh, group gatherings where you've gotten to hear feedback and people's questions and engagements, just like today. So I love how the book tour is expanding and furthering the life of the book and the overall conversation that you are trying to have. But tell us a few tales from the road. Uh, I have been surprised at the number of people who have stood up and just unburdened themselves. Uh, a man in Ohio who said, I think I have been pressing. He turned that into a verb. Um, people all my life. And I wish I could go back and talk to some of the people that I've said the wrong thing to, or I just have not been open. Um, elsewhere in Ohio, a man brought everyone in his office and um and they were a group of people and they were all white men that were sitting in the in the audience and you know looking like they were forced to go and they kind of were by this this fellow and he said you know we work in financial services and the future of america looks different than my office and in order for us to survive we're going to have to get used to providing financial services to people who don't look like us and so i asked my team to come here today um with the idea that maybe this can start in um, in many places, people in the book show up and they will say, I'm on page 274, I'm page 315. Uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, a woman came and she uh, her postcard is in the book. And she talked about, you know, remember now Louisville is a place where Breonna Taylor was killed in her home. 
in her apartment. And she said that she no longer feels comfortable. This is a woman of color, black woman. And she sat in the front row and she stood up and told her story. She said, I no longer feel comfortable in my apartment. I'm always wondering, can someone break in even though they're looking for somebody else? And while that fear may seem irrational in the room, you could feel the room saying, well, okay, that I understand the fear, but that's not likely to happen. The room changed, packed audience at a public library in Louisville. When she explained that, Brianna Taylor was one of her colleagues. And my goodness, that, my story, goodness. that story just, Lizzie, it hit my heart because she, it, it made me think of an aspect of this that I hadn't. She said, you know, for many people, they've moved on, even with the trial that had just happened. They moved on from the story in a way that she can't. Because in that office, imagine if one of your colleagues just never came back to work. Just never came back to work. And what do you do with the desk? What do you do when you walk past and see the smiling photos on that desk? See all the things that you put on the desk to make your space comfortable. And knowing that the pictures of her family just remind you of a family that now has an empty seat at the table. And that desk becomes a shrine and then an altar and then a tombstone of sorts. And so the, the stories that we continue to collect from the road, again, are another aspect of these sort of hidden stories um, that are in the sort of tendrils and tributaries of America that, that even as a journalist who tries to get out and cover the world that I otherwise would not be able to access. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Um, one of our uh, listeners um, would love to hear a little bit about your um, growing up in Minnesota and mention specifically school integration, busing, uh, and what you can tell us about uh, the racial climate that you grew up in. Um, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, with a father that was from Birmingham, Alabama. So every summer I was sent to Birmingham, Alabama, and every, you know, the, re the remainder of the year I lived in Minnesota. Um, shout out to all the music acts that came from Minnesota. You may be wondering, does she know Prince? Um, he grew up in my neighborhood. My cousin, my first cousin was a bass player in his band uh, for a time. And Lizzie, you've heard me tell this story that you may know of a group called The Time when I was in high school. They Who were played, your prom? They played, Who played prom. your prom? So that was what life was like in, in Minnesota. Um, it was a newly integrated community that I lived in, in part because my family was one of the first families to move past a line of demarcation to the far south side in Minneapolis looking for better schools. It was, I think, a moment that I realize now, a, a, a moment, a flashpoint of integration that happened because of a lot of courage on the part of people like my parents, but also a good deal of social engineering. And I grew up in schools that were integrated and I had friends who were of all colors. And when I go back to Minneapolis now, I see less of that. And what has happened in Minneapolis, as in so many other places, there's sort of a resegregation that's happened, in part because we took our hands off the levers of the social engineering that helped make that happen, um, but in part because of, you know, something called homosociality, that people often want to live among their own. They are comfortable living among their own. And that became evident in the work that was done after George Floyd to sort of understand um, Minneapolis and understand a city where a national tragedy had, you know, had taken place um, and how that was indicative of what had happened, what had happened, what was happening in so many, you know, American cities is the flashpoint of integration and then a resegregation that we're seeing in city after city after city across America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this question comes from Phoenix, Arizona. In your view, how do the narratives we embrace or confront about race in America shape our collective identity and values? And what role do you believe personal revelations play in transforming these narratives for future generations? I, um, because of the work I do now, most especially, but I have long believed that personal narrative is, is a very potent way to tell a story. Uh, 
this harkens back to the previous question about, you know, where I grew up. I, maybe I wrote a book like this because of the books that we had in our household. My parents loved anthologies. You know, we had The Color of Man. We had Still Hungry in America. Um, I have behind me the original copy of The Black Book, which was produced by Toni Morrison, uh, which was a wonderful compilation of Black accomplishment, you know, in America that that uh, had not, you know, to that point been well understood. Uh, and I think those personal stories provide individual epiphanies that live in your head in a different way than the things that you read in history books or what you might watch on PBS or, you know, in entertainment or even in, in, um, in, in books that, you know, you keep on your shelf. The power of personal narrative is something that I don't think we um, elevate or celebrate. At the same time, collective memory is also quite potent, and that's really what shapes our narratives. And America is a country that has gotten pretty good at institutional amnesia, um, at full erasure of American stories. And that's a function of who's in the room doing the remembering and deciding what is remembered. And when we thought we were at a point of... um, perhaps correcting that narrative and creating a more inclusive story, you know, we now are facing significant headwinds from people who don't want to tell a full American story, who are afraid that if we talk about some of the things um, that have happened in our past, if we talk about our original sins, if we talk about the dark corners of American history, that it will make some people feel bad, that um, it will somehow tarnish, you know, the overall American story. And that story is made up of small individual narratives, even though it's part of sort of the grand, you know, in the grand sweep of history. Those granular stories, I think, are what might help us push through um, some of that discomfort by looking at, yes, the things that make us uncomfortable, but also the triumph that, that lies within those stories. I mean, one of the reasons that I there are many reasons why I um, oppose the narrowing of American history, the pushback against the telling of American history. But one is I feel like it's a form of larceny, that it it robs America of its origin story. It prevents us from telling uh, the truth. It prevents us from telling the entire story. But in terms of my personal narrative as an African-American, it robs me of a benchmark that helps me understand where we've come. Um, it robs me of a benchmark that helps me understand the triumph. If you look at a people who were not allowed to read and write and the 7,000% increase in literacy that happened in the 100 years after slavery, uh, that is, yes, that's a story that when we look back at what happened, you know, during a period of enslavement, yes, we should feel bad about that, but also it robs us of an ability, the ability to also feel a little bit better about where we come as a society. And, so I hope that, um, you know, I hope that we prevail in this effort to be able to tell America's story in full. Mellon Foundation is is doing uh, God's work in making sure that that happens. And Elizabeth, you know, hats off to you in particular for what you're doing in the work around uh, looking at our monuments and what they represent um, and how they tell a story. And most of our monuments, you know, they're two, you know, either big moments or big figures in American history. But the monuments are built by individuals, right? Their, the decision to build that monument was made by an individual, and they usually in some way tell stories that are tied to individual narratives. And in looking at the monuments that we have, but also the monuments that we miss, and I think that personal narratives stand as monuments unto themselves. Um, that That is part of you know, I, I, I literally look at when someone tells their story, that is a monument unto itself. It stands as almost, you know, as something that is spoken by word, written on a postcard, sent in in six words, but it still stands in my mind as a monument to personal experience that will help us understand a grander story. That's beautiful. Thank you. And that that speaks to, um, but, you know, to, to, to say more, a question from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, what are strategies to combat the attempt to keep others from learning about the experiences and history of marginalized groups in this country. I mean, so there's the work that we're all trying to do, but what more can you say about that? Showing up. 
showing up. That's, that's, that's one thing showing up, um, and organizing and recognizing that there are people who are spending a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy. They're doing focus groups. Um, this is not happening in an anaerobic way. Um, it is happening because people are organizing and deciding um, to be smart about this. And, you know, I don't agree with the, the objective, but I will say that that the means by which they're doing this are impressive at times in the way that they're able to um, understand the messaging around this, understand how to work the levers of power, uh, showing up in force at school board meetings. And you wonder, is anyone on the other side showing up? Um, blowing up the phones when a certain book is taught are someone is someone from the other side or from a different side blowing up the phone in the same way is there a, a counter narrative that is developing a counter pressure that's being used to to basically meet um the pressures that are being you know placed upon individuals and institutions you know to change that narrative uh I, you know, the analogy I always use is if you want to, if you want to affect change, it's much like in your personal life. If you want to affect change, you, you have to get involved. You, you're, you're not, you know, you can watch someone on a treadmill all day long. You're not personally going to lose weight. You're not personally going to get healthier by watching, you know, someone Shoot. else, you know, on that elliptical, <laughs> right? At some point, if you want to affect change, you're going to have to get on the machine yourself. You're going to have to go take a walk. You're going to have to actually get up and get out. and and um, for you know, people who lament this moment and expect someone else to do that, someone else to make the calls, someone else to get organized, it's it's the stakes are just too high to sit on the sidelines for something like this. Well, um, we are now out of our our, our makeup time um, and then some, but I want to thank you so much. I mean, really, we could all together carry on in this conversation for a long, long time. And I think that your work is helping us carry on in conversation. I love the community that has been made in the time that we've been together today. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you to close because I know you've answered this at various moments in time. Uh, what might be your six word story today? You know, when I began, my six word story was fooled them all not done yet because a life as a communicator was not imagined to me. Um, I'm a black girl from Minnesota. I had a speech impediment when I was a kid. No one thought that I would grow up and become a communicator. Um, and so that was a little, you know, show you, fool them all, not done yet. But because of the work that I do, because of the forces that we were talking about that are trying to change America's narrative and narrow the teaching of history and narrow the conversations that we have and redefine um, what it means to live in, a, in a, an America that is diverse and can actually celebrate that diversity. I now come down on a different six words and I, my six words are still more work to be done um, because I, I don't know that we will ever, I mean, I hope that we will become a society that is post-racist, but I don't know that we'll become a society that's post-racial. Look at our makeup. And that's one of the things that, that I think is most beautiful about the country that we all live in and share. And so, yeah, still more work to be done. Amen. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, community. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you at the next conversation. Please uh, add the book to your collection if you don't have it already. And, uh, and love to you and to everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.